how do we truly grow and focus on being loving, high quality character and overly vulnerable humans related to where we are today and where we're headed? You had to ask the hardest question. What I'm really intrigued by uh, is, everyone's going to have a tutor in their pocket uh, or on a computer. A college education doesn't get you a job. Your peers and your children are going to be like, wow, we were living in the dark ages at a time where like not everyone had access to their potential. And right now, that humility to see the world as it is, is to go as fast as we can to build things, not necessarily to help people, but to enable people to help themselves. Uh, let's begin. Um, and uh, let's go to Mike One over there. Hey, Bear. Oh, hey. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? This is my deputy son, Bear. Hi, Bear, nice Bear to Reese. Meet you guys. Wow. It's okay. so, uh, first of all, Bear, how old are you? I'm 11. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, I have two paternal twin boys. Chris and I have. We're 11 as well. Best They're friends with Bear. They're pretty awesome. Yeah, they'll be here in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. What's up, Bear? Not much. Am I allowed to ask my question? You can. You're first. The most articulate. Okay, cool. This one's directed at Jacqueline. Um, so I've been wondering because it's kind of confusing for me because you're kind of helping fund these companies. And what, what if AI eventually takes over like those labor jobs and the thinking jobs? Cause then what's the point of, I guess, helping those people if they aren't gonna, what do you think is going to happen to them once AI takes over labor jobs? You had to ask the hardest question of the whole conference. Not an easy one. It's hard. Yeah, he's, he's a smart kid. I think about that a lot, actually. Um, that, you know, you take a country like India alone, and every year, 20 million new young people are going into a labor force. And increasingly, where we work, a college education doesn't get you a job. We've got the largest chicken um, farm in Ethiopia, and most of the people that are being hired now have college educations because that's where they can make money. So my hope is that these jobs become, that word accompaniment, these jobs end up using the technology uh, to do more things for the world rather than just push people aside. I also think that when we look at agriculture, especially where most of the poor people are poor, are, are farmers, yeah. um, we are going to see a lot of displacement, but we are starting to see new systems where young people are deciding they want to become farmers for the first time in my life, be, to become farmers rather than leave it because they can produce really beautiful uh, foods for the people who live locally. And so we might start to see new things happening in the world, but uh, in the short term, all we can do is what we can do. And right now, that humility to see the world as it is, is to go as fast as we can to build things, not necessarily to help people, but to enable people to help themselves. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you, your Bear. question. Bear, you. Ryan, where are you on mic four? Where's Ryan? This is, this is Bear's sister, Hi. my deputy daughter. Hey, Ryan. Talk to us. What's your, what's your comment or question, Ryan? Um, this is kind of more directed to Sal. Uh-huh. But... Mm. <laughs> How much do you think education for kids will change in the next 10 years with AI? How old are you now, uh, Ryan? Nine. Nine, okay. Yes. Cool. <laughs> a great, great question. Uh, something I think a lot about. Uh, I think a, a lot of what we currently know about education, in some ways, some of those things will stay the same. But I think some of the main issues with education, like um, a lot of students honestly don't even have access to, you know, Jacqueline talked a lot about that. Um, I think uh, college education is, you know, more and more ridiculously expensive over time. 
Um, I think you know just being able to have support, even if you come, even if you even if you have a reasonably well-resourced school, you really don't aren't able to get help right when you need it. And so I think those are the things that in the next 10 years, you literally are going to have, everyone's going to have a tutor in their pocket uh, or on a computer that's going to be pretty rich, uh, that, that you're going to be able to uh, engage with pretty deeply. Um, that is, isn't just a, a supplement, something on the side uh, to help you, but it could also, if you need it to be, almost drive your complete education. You're going to be able to get credit and uh, degrees, um, let's call it... Uh, you know, proof that you have skills that are going to be valuable for folks, and hopefully you can get automa automatically connected to experiences, jobs, internships uh, that that'll get you what you need. So I I think education. I know, you know, you know education is one of been one of these areas that for a while people are have been very hopeful, but also they've been very like, oh, I don't know if anything good's going to happen. We keep trying, and nothing really changes. I've never been more bullish that you know by the time you're 19 years old, uh, you're going to have a world where um, you know, your peers and your children are going to be like, wow, we were living in the dark ages at a time where like not everyone had access to their potential. Uh, I think, I think 10 years will, will, will make that. And the only thing that might, that might keep it is going to be other things like infrastructure, electricity, wars, um, that, that will keep people from having access. But if we have those basic things in place, I think pretty much anyone's going to have access to a, a world. Ryan, situation. let's give it up for Ryan Reese here. Everybody, I want to take a short break from our episode to talk about a company that's very important to me and could actually save your life or the life of someone that you love. The company is called Fountain Life. And it's a company I started years ago with Tony Robbins and a group of very talented physicians. You know, most of us don't actually know what's going on inside our body. We're all optimists. Until that day when you have a pain in your side, you go to the physician in the emergency room and they say, listen, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have this stage three or four going on. And you know, it didn't start that morning. It probably was a problem that's been going on for some time, but because we never look, we don't find out. So what we built at Fountain Life was the world's most advanced diagnostic centers. We have four across the US today, and we're building 20 around the world. These centers give you a full body MRI, a brain, a brain vasculature, an AI enabled coronary CT looking for soft plaque, a DEXA scan, a Grail blood cancer test, a full executive blood workup. It's the most advanced workup you'll ever receive. 150 gigabytes of data that then go to our AIs and our physicians to find any disease at the very beginning when it's solvable. You're going to find out eventually. You might as well find out when you can take action. Fountain Life also has an entire side of the therapeutics. We look around the world for the most advanced therapeutics that can add 10, 20 healthy years to your life. And we provide them to you at our centers. So if this is of interest to you, please go and check it out. Go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter. When Tony and I wrote our New York Times bestseller, Life Force, we had 30,000 people reached out to us for Fountain Life memberships. If you go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter, we'll put you to the top of the list. Really, it's something that is, um, for me, one of the most important things I offer my entire family, the CEOs of my companies, my friends, it's a chance to really add decades onto our healthy lifespans. Go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter. It's one of the most important things I can offer to you as one of my listeners. All right, let's go back to our episode. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Jacqueline and Sal, for two uh, inspiring presentations. Uh, my question is for Sal. I'm here with, I'm 25. I'm here with my 14-year-old cousin, Julian. We've both been users of Khan Academy for a while. Um, it's it's surreal actually seeing you and hearing you talk because I've seen I've heard you through a screen so much. I feel like I wouldn't it's, have. It's made a little it. disappointing seeing the physical. <laughs> <part>. <laughs> a little older and shorter. Than I've me. watched your differential equation Khan Academy video more than I would care to admit. <laughs> Um, but, but anyways, we're wondering how we can be guinea pigs for Khan Migo. Julian's been using Khan Academy in his English classes at school. He's in eighth grade and I've used them virtually through college, through engineering. And, um, it's very, very cool tool. We would love to help you further. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and there is a process, actually anyone here, uh, so and this is an interesting phenomenon about uh, these large language models, especially GPT-4, which is an order of magnitude more complex than uh, GPT-3, is that they're not, they're not cheap. You know, it's not like internet where the marginal cost is like a few pennies. Right now, um, it's, it's sizable. We, we're trying to gauge on how much people are going to use it, but it's definitely on the order of like probably five, 10, 15 dollars a month or something like that. So what we've done right out the gate while it's in the beta test mode, um, not, is we, we're, we're providing it to some school districts just to start testing it and using it, but we're also making it so that if people donate on, on our site at ConLabs, uh, I, I think it's $20 a month, then that will unlock, you can be on the waiting list of ConMigo. So your parents can, if your parents donate, then they can unlock it once they're taken off the waiting list for, their, for the children. So that's what we're going to do. And the reason why I'm bullish on it, because, you know, even at that price, it's a lot of value relative to like hiring a tutor and all of that. But we have good reason to believe that over the next six to 12 months, that cost is going to come down by a factor of 10 or a factor of 50. Uh, some on our side efficiency, some on the side of uh, the folks developing the large language models. Um, but yeah, but if you want to get in like, this week or next week or something, yeah, get on the waiting list. Okay, will do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Maximilian, let's get it up for Joe. Thank you, Joe, for your question. Yeah. Maximilian, what so do you got? This one's for Jacqueline. Um, Jacqueline. Oh, hi. Hi, hi. Uh, I may actually say I'm a big fan of yours. You actually inspired my first MTP and Moonshot back in 2009. And uh, I spent the last 15 years essentially following that's that wow. track. What was it? Um, it was actually empowering entrepreneurs in Africa building sustainable healthcare companies and for their local communities. Fantastic. Um, so I've now actually moved on and uh, amended or developed my, my moonshot further. And I'm now CEO of a company called Next Boardroom. And our mission is very much along the lines of what, what your challenge actually is. So bringing the right sustainable mindsets and competencies into boardrooms around the world. So I would love to talk with you how we can scale Acumen Academy in that context um, to yeah, every company around the world. I would love that. And also so many of the young social entrepreneurs, um, we need to teach them how to build their boards and then use, because many of them don't have family and friends networks. Um, find people who can really show up and be great board members for them. So would love to have that conversation with you. Thank you. Awesome. And thank you, Maximilian. Thank you. Let's go to our global virtual members next on Zoom. Uh, Josh, what do you have? Yes, hello everyone. Zooming in from Denver. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. you're great. All right, great. Um, yeah, thanks for the chat here. Sal and Jacqueline's amazing uh, comments and this question is related to a quote and comment that you had yesterday, Peter, in a breakout session, whereas humans need to become really great at being humans and let the AI and robots do the rest of the computerized and automated work. So leaning into the gratitude for this tech and removing the fear mindset, how do we truly grow and focus on being loving, high quality character and overly vulnerable humans related to where we are today and where we're headed? I'll tell you, I mean, it, you know, it's, it could definitely connects to the, um, what we talked about earlier about the role of the teacher. And in a world of abundance, I mean, this is one thing I don't we're ever going to have a surplus of human connection. And so as, you know, even if you just take a classroom as a microcosm for like the world, um, as you have AIs and tools like Khan Academy that's able to do a lot more of the coordination, a lot more of the assessment, a lot more of the practice, um, it unlocks all of that time and space for the human to just have more conversations, uh, have more games, have more simulations. And I actually think we just need to scale that up even, even beyond the classroom. And what I'm really intrigued by uh, is ways that not only can the technology take things off of the human's plate, but actually can facilitate yes. uh, human connections. You know, I, one, one thing that I'm hoping to have built in the next year is we know in middle school, it's a tough time. There's a lot of dynamics and there's the cool kids and the lot cool kids and there's all these clicks. You know, how amazing if you could have an AI facilitate a conversation between two members of your class. Maybe you don't even know who the person you're talking to, but you can show that vulnerability. You can show that, hey, there's another human being no matter what their stereotype is. Um, I, think, I think things like that are, are where we're going to get a lot of... Uh, human value from. There's a term that Dan Sullivan first shared with me. I think it comes only from the, from the uh, from Four Seasons. 
you know, let's, let's automate the routine and humanize the exceptional, mm -hmm. which I love that. Yeah, I, I, I love that question. And it's certainly something I'm obsessed with. Um, as I said, how do you teach character? It's something Sal and I are talking about. Um, what, we're, what, what we found, at least on a, um, a global level, but with thousands, not yet millions, um, is through ritual, through language, through um, more organized groups and, and the Socratic method of having people speak across lines of difference to build a sense of community really is possible. And my question now is how do we scale it? Um, and storytelling. Our media continues to tell stories of people who do a lot of bad things um, and still are put on pedestals. Uh, rather than those individuals who are, have an abundance of kindness, an abundance of goodness, abundance of generosity. We know that wealth does not correlate to empathy. And so part of it, I think, is also finding a new kind of role model, um, which is sort of an old-fashioned kind of role model, but the ones that we want to be like, but we're sometimes afraid to really celebrate, and our media could do a better job, and so can we. We're going to go to Julian on Zoom one more time. Thank you for your, your question. And then we're going to go to John next over here. So Julian, uh, where are you and what's your question? What's going on? Hey, I'm reporting here from one of the villas in the resort. So not too far, based in San Francisco though. But yeah, great talk from the both of you. Um, yeah, I'm going to ride off of um, Abara's first question since that's been very top of mind because I'm, I'm building an AI learning tool named Wizbolia. So learning and AI has been super top of mind. And the question here is based on the challenge that there's, you know, the world's moving faster than ever and there's massive disruption that's going to come from jobs. So it's a question around what are the future proof skills? What are the future proof jobs? How do we deal with that transition period? from like so many people just being displaced. I think learning has a lot to do with it. So it's like, what should we be learning and how do we become exponential learners and individuals in this new exponential age? Thank you, Julian. Uh, Sal, do you want to take that on? Yeah, look, it's, it's something I've been struggling with. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us try to run optimistic about, you know, inflection points in technology and new jobs that we can't imagine can be created. I know, we, you know we've all, all heard that. But it, it is amazing, I mean, just even over the last six months uh, when, you know, when, as soon as uh, we had access to GPT-4 back in August, I started telling all of our team members, like, look, you got to figure out how this is changing your work. I mean, we've done, as a not-for-profit, we've done things like an email exchange with a donor. We just take those 10 emails, throw it to GPT-4, and it wrote the proposal for us. Um, and then we tweaked it for like, you know, 20 minutes, but then it, it got that done. I was originally, so I was like, oh, maybe this is the skill of the future, being able to you know, be a prompt engineer and tweak the AI. But then as we were working with OpenAI, it, it, it got more steerable. So we had to do a little bit less of the, the dark art of how do you get the AI to do exactly what you want. So you know, if I were to guess in you know, two or three generations, even that is going to, you're, that's, that's not going Go to be Go raise me money. <laughs> was that? Yeah, yeah if, 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 raising money might always be a, 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 a AI-proof skill. Um, but but uh, yeah, I, I, it's a. Um, I I think it'll be the human, the ability. I think the critical thinking plus the human connection. If you can form bonds with other human beings, I think you're always going to have a a, a strong. Ethic. And I'll say one last thing. You know, my college roommate. He's this guy that none of us thought we're gonna. He, he's not like the Wheeler Dealer stereotypical VC guy. But he's always a guy that he's super vulnerable. He becomes best friends with anyone wherever he is. And he's become an incredibly successful investor, essentially based on that skill. And the more I think about it, I think his skill is probably the most uh, fascinating. Yeah. Resilient. I, I think the caring economy really matters here, that um, we're becoming lonely as a society. And so whether it's an accompaniment model that we're, we saw first in Africa and now we're seeing in the United States where people will call pe uh, people with chronic diseases um, to see if, not only if they've taken their meds, but are they exercising and helping them learn how to grocery shop, et cetera, et cetera. What we didn't expect um, was the bonds that would be created within community. What we did expect is that people would stay healthy and not get sick and that would save a lot of money and you could build a revenue model around it. So I actually think that those individuals who um, can show up, can care, can build community, 
will also be something that we not only value, but longer term monetize. Everybody, I want to take a quick break from our episode and tell you about a health product that I love and that I use every day. In fact, I use it twice a day. It's called Seed Health. Now, your microbiome and gut health are one of the most important and modifiable parts of your health plan. Your gut microbiome is connected to your brain health, your cardiac health, your metabolic health. So the question is, what are you doing to optimize your gut? Let me take a second to tell you what I'm doing. Every day, I take two capsules of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. It's a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic formulation that supports digestive health, gut health, skin health, heart health, and more. It contains 24 clinically studied and scientifically backed probiotic strains that are delivered in a patented capsule that actually protects it from the stomach acid and ensures that all of it reaches your colon alive with 100% survivability. Now, if you want to try Seed's Daily Symbiotic for yourself, you can get a 25% off your first month's supply by using the code MOONSHOTS at checkout. Just go to seed.com backslash MOONSHOTS and enter the code MOONSHOTS at checkout. That's seeds.com backslash MOONSHOTS and use the code MOONSHOTS to get 25% off your first month of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. Trust me, your gut will thank you. All right, let's get back to our episode. Amazing. John, let's go to you. It's, it's an honor to speak to you guys. Jacqueline, um, I serve on the board of a um, nonprofit in southwestern Kenya that provides education to uh, uh, children in the Maasai land in the bush. Um, we've seen great progress by providing additional health care and nutrition for our children, um, accelerated learning. And I was curious, do any of your entrepreneurs invest in nutrition and healthcare to facilitate education and in the spirit of the conference, how might we use AI to benefit us in those places? That's a great question. Um, we don't invest directly in nutrition, but we do invest in education and a lot of the best education models um, either will partner with philanthropy or the state um, because of the power of a, as you know, a single healthy meal every day. In countries like India with a 45% child malnutrition rate or across Africa where you've got stunting pretty much across the continent, that really matters. Um, I don't have off the top of my mind for you a particular company that is sp focused specifically on the, f the school feeding, um, but I'll, I'll give that some thought. Perhaps there's an opportunity there. Yeah. I mean, we lose 40% of our agricultural production um, before it gets to the plate. Um, in the developing world, it's all food rots on the side of the road. It's never sold at market. You could actually see AI doing a much better job uh, locating and finding ways to move that food more effectively to the people who really need it. Um, it would be one thing that would come to mind. And then, of course, in the wealthy world, we lose 40% of the food after it gets to our plate, and we just waste it. And so there's, I would think there's a huge opportunity there. We've got something like uh, 15 questions and 12 minutes left, so I'm going to speed round it a As a bit. young Kenyan guy said to me, so please, be short. <laughs> so uh, this is from Slido. Uh, this is for Sal from one of your former students. What do you need or are looking for in a partner uh, to help reach Sultanas in the world? I'll say you know, two things really fast. Uh, one, we, we have 50 plus localization efforts, including in, you know, Pashto, Dari Farsi and, and all of these. And, and, you know, and there's other parts like Afghanistan, if we're talking about uh, the Middle East, et cetera. Um, so folks can actually volunteer and, 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 and localize. Uh, we have different degrees of efforts in every geography. So that's one, I think, thing that anyone can do if they have language skills. Um, the second one is, you know, I hate to say it, but resources do matter here. I was telling Peter earlier that, um, you know, the, for, for domestic English, like our budget's a budget of about a large high school. It's about 60 million a year. Uh, global education spends five trillion a year. Um, so we're a vapor of a vapor of that. Uh, but like we think, you know, for like if we were able to put about a million or two behind uh, supporting our platform to go right to left, that would be a huge thing. And That's then the million we're we're trying to raise. You know, I having dinner yeah. with uh, Will I Am and the patrons on Sunday night, and he said something that was amazing. He said, you know, raising money to educate AIs is easy. Raising money to educate our kids is hard. 
Yeah. He's crazy. It, it, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> Raising right. money is hard. Period. Uh, let's go to, uh, to Harsha on, on mic three. Please. Hi. Thanks a lot for uh, organizing this. Like, Oh, one, uh, we have two questions actually, but let me just give let's you a pick, Let's pick one because yeah. we have a lot of people waiting. Sure. So basically the question we have is, uh, I actually went to India and we used, tried to use Khan Academy's thing and I also tried to use robots, right? And one thing which we found out was kids actually were building robots. They got, they got to learn a lot more and it was very hard for them to learn directly from Khan Academy. So what we did was we actually created something called hollow world where holographically now they were able to combine minecraft type of things roblox minecraft with lego type of things and that has actually done very well so and there is in india there is something called co-profit right so you can i have csr where people can uh, actually take money from profits and put it into non-profit so why in your case, these two have not happened. And the second question is, is there an API with Khan Academy which I can use for this holographic universe I'm building, which can be integrated so that I can present this Alexander, all these things yeah. are there in the holographic world, great, well, but great we questions. need an API. Yeah, un un for we, unfortunately, um, we, we don't have the API today. It might be coming back in the next year or two. Um, in terms of, I agree with you, uh, you know, if you can embody it and all of that, I mean, I think that's, you know, we talked about the Sultanas. There are certain students who can just power through in the current form factor. Uh, but the more that we can make it engaging, we can make it embodied, whatever, I think it is going to help a ton. Thank you. Let's go to Carl and Mike too. Carl. Thank you both for the impact you're making, first of all. But uh, Sal, my question's for you is, uh, I'm curious what your predictions are related to avatars and, and kind of how that either replaces teachers or kind of uh, acts as that tutor to teachers. And interestingly, yesterday we heard a stat on how children actually are more likely to tell the truth to an avatar psychologist versus a physical person there. So I'm curious how you think that plays in education. Yeah, I'll say a couple of real quick things is, you know, what we've always said is we want to raise the floor for so many kids because they don't have access to school. So there, and, and we think now with the AI, the floor can be raised pretty significantly. So it's even better than your average well-resourced experience at some point. But we also want to raise the ceiling. If you have an amazing teacher, we're going to be able to make that teacher even, even more, more empowered. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, avatars themselves. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny that I, I, when I watched the Harry Potter series, I always thought the, the craziest, most unrealistic part of Harry Potter were those picture frames that could like represent dead people and that could talk. Um, and now I realize that's actually the most realistic part of, of Harry Potter. Um, and, and so I think there's something very interesting. I, mean, I think there's even a couple of startups that are already like you can like download someone's personality and it's about to get a lot better. Yeah, we got in the tech hub over here. Go and check, check yeah. out. So, so, yeah, I, I, I think you're going to have a way to kind of persist and create people. I mean, we, we have a fun little project of, like, can we create an embodied Sal scale tutor? You know, maybe, maybe in six months you'll have something like that. I don't know. But um, it, it, it is a little bit wild what's about to happen. Hey, everybody. This is Peter. A quick break from the episode. You know, I'm a firm believer that science and technology and how entrepreneurs can change the world is the only real news out there worth consuming. I don't watch the crisis news network I call CNN or Fox and hear every devastating piece of news on the planet. I spend my time training my neural net the way I see the world by looking at the incredible breakthroughs in science and technology, how entrepreneurs are solving the world's grand challenges, what the breakthroughs are in longevity, how exponential technologies are transforming our world, so twice a week, I put out a blog. One blog is looking at the future of longevity, age reversal, biotech, increasing your health span. The other blog looks at exponential technologies, AI, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain. These technologies are transforming what you as an entrepreneur can do. If this is the kind of news you want to learn about and shape your neural nets with, go to demandus.com backslash blog and learn more. Now back to the episode. We're going to be going to Zoom in a moment, but uh, Zaya, uh, what's your question? Yeah, so I'm drawn towards Sultana, right? And these other Sultanas that didn't believe that they could actually transcend this paradigm. So I'm thinking of systems thinking and meadows, and one of the biggest levers is helping people realize that they're in a paradigm, 
right? And are you doing anything utilizing exponential technologies to help people realize that they're fit within this box and inspiring that desire to learn? And the same thing to you, Jacqueline, with you know this coffee company that you're working with, those sorts of things. How do you inspire these people to take charge and take that first step to utilize these amazing tools? I, I you, you know, I think the first step is just a, giving them a, a place where they can realize that they are interested in discovering these academic abilities. And when they, they can see, oh, compared to my brothers in the local school, I'm actually learning more. And wow, there's all this interesting stuff. I think the AI is going to get access to that more. I think we've all, many of us, when you're reading a book and you're like, wow, I really connect with Voltaire or I really connect with Mark Twain, but that's a one-way situation. Mm -hmm. I think the artificial intelligence turns this into a two-way conversation. So I think we're going to be able to unlock even more there. But I think the number one thing is as soon as people can start to say, wow, I'm, I'm exercising, just as it feels good to exercise your body, mm -hmm. as soon as you exercise your mind and you realize what you're capable of, um, it starts to put you on a path. Yeah, I... I um I also think that storytelling and um and and finding more people who look like the people that we're also mm. looking to empower really matters. We have a company that um it's essentially a woman doctor in Pakistan. Thirty percent of all women doctors stop practicing when they get married. So first you have to change that. Um has put all these women doctors on a tech platform so that they can actually provide health care to rural women often for the first time in their lives. Um, so you've got to get rural women in places like northern Pakistan where the education rate or literacy rate is 4% for women to trust that they can talk to a doctor who might be sitting in New York um, and use that. But the fact that they look like them, they can speak the language, and that there are local agents, and Sal and I were talking about this before, including with education, that local teacher, she might be illiterate, but she'll be learning at the same time as the students learn. That that role modeling is really, really important. And then the second way through storytelling would be things like um, for farmers in India, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but Bollywood actors actually really matter um, for that kind of endorsement. And so uh, things we might not uh, really, things we might take for granted are often wrong. And so um, I think that we need more creativity, and that's also where AI can, can help us. I'm going to try and power through three more questions. We're going to Robert on Zoom. Keep it short, if you would. Robert, where are you, and what's your question? Hi, calling from Phoenix, Arizona. I've Sunny heard of it. Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, uh, for Saul, hmm. is there a way for the Khan Academy to partner with uh, the industry to bring courses that don't exist uh, in colleges for vocational specific learning, uh, such as in soil engineering, which is a practice that is done uh, virtually beyond what they teach in college? Great question. S simple answer is yes. And what I've been, you know, some people think vocational, they think it's only a certain category and not the kind of the career track white collar jobs. One of the things I'm fascinated in is can we give people this core set of skills that you don't need to sit in a, four, a chair for four years, uh, but are, put you even in the same category as a, a college graduate, but also obviously can work on these things that we don't normally associate with a college degree. So the simple answer is yes, and, and we're working on it. We're starting to talk to several companies about, hey, if someone just did this on Khan Academy, why don't you put them in the same category as someone with a 3.5 GPA from Stanford? And, and the companies are serious about it now. Fantastic. Jeff Peoples, what's your question, pal? Uh, Jacqueline, what is what are the uh, what access do we have to your teaching about character development? What is there something that we could bring onto our teams, especially our you know young people here in is, the United States? You're saying? Well, I have anyway, around the world, I'm okay. just you know I'm just like okay, and it's actually especially more important for or around the world because it's like no well, anyway, you have something we can access now. Uh, so um. I don't, so I have, a, I have a couple of books, but uh, my last book is called Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, and it's 12 practices that we have found in our most successful entrepreneurs to be very effective in um, building companies that put our humanity at the center. It's all about character. And then Acumen Academy um, is the start. There are about 40 different courses already. Um, that are very much about that. And we're starting to partner with corporations that are having their teams take the courses together. And so would love to talk to you about, about both of those. And Jacqueline, you're going to be staying here through Thursday? No, but only through this evening, Okay, so Jacqueline's here 
at lunch and in, in the evening. So catch but this is a crowd that wears a lot of black, so you should be able to find it. <laughs> Carla, you're our final question here. Sorry, guys. Yes. Sal, thank you. I'm going to become a donor, and you're my hero. Um, I'm a, a pioneer in advancing education for dyslexic learners. I've founded Athena Academy in the Bay Area. And so my question is, how can we work with Khan Academy so it works better for dyslexic kids. We love what you do, but our dyslexics don't work as well as non-dyslexics with your materials and platform. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. Um, you know, honestly, I think it's just a, a, a bandwidth and serialization issue. Uh, you know, we've gotten some feedback that it does work for certain students with dyslexia and other, um, you know, learning differences, but we haven't honestly been able to focus on that problem in particular. You probably have good insights there. So, you know, if there's low-hanging fruit that we, if we did X, Y, and Z, it could dramatic, like we want to hear that. And then, you know, I'm hoping in the next several years we can start to have more capacity to start, you know, uh, focusing on some of these, on these, uh, these situations. I hope we can talk. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Sal Khan and Jacqueline Novogratz. Hey.